Welcome to another episode of The Secret of the Golden Flower. Now today I'm finally <laughs> going to get around to showing the path that leads to enlightenment. And why did I wait so long? <laughs> because I had to prepare the ground first. You know, people want a quick fix for everything, an instant solution. Just push a button, right? Well, some things aren't so easy. There are certain understandings that require a background, a context. And until that context is established, the explanation cannot be understood. Huh? So when we talk about dependent origination, when we talk about the process of becoming or the process of enlightenment, it's the same process but just applied in a different way. You'll see what I'm talking about in a couple of minutes. So first we have to understand the whole background. How did we get into this situation? How are we creating our being, whether we realize it or not? And how can we switch from an unconscious process of becoming to a conscious process of becoming that leads to enlightenment? Because otherwise it just leads to suffering, death, and rebirth. And we don't want that anymore. Huh? That's the whole idea behind this series. We want to get out of samsara. We want to go, if we can't attain enlightenment here, in this situation, then we have to find a means to go to a situation where we can. And that is the process of becoming, conscious becoming which the Buddha gave. So, let's take another look at dependent origination. Okay, here's the whole circle. And again, the red buttons or fields lead down to suffering. And most of the time, people go from suffering and death right back to becoming ignorance, fabrication, and so on. But let's say a person finally bottoms out. Huh? You know, they say in AA, you can't really quit until you finally hit bottom. And what does that mean? It means things get so bad you can't take it anymore and you finally decide, all right, I'm going to reshuffle my priorities and I'm going to make growing my top priority. A lot of people tell me, oh, I don't have time to watch all the videos, or I don't have time to meditate, you know. Do you have time to suffer and die? Do you? Because that's what's going to happen. If you don't take this path of transcendence, path of enlightenment, you're going to suffer, die, and be reborn into the same stinking world and maybe in, in a lower form than you are now. So I'm not, I'm not trying to threaten you. I'm not trying to coerce you. I'm trying to get you to make some space and time for your own process of enlightenment. Nobody's going to do it for you. In fact, most of the people in your life are going to fight against you. They're going to resist. They're going to delay. They're going to say, well, no, you just have to do this and you just have to do that. Bullshit. Enlightenment comes first. And when you have that value, everything falls into line behind it. So anyway, <laughs> this process of enlightenment begins from conviction. That's where we left off last time. When you actually try any of the processes of enlightenment, huh, there's 84,000 Dharma doors. So there is a way for anything to be used as a means of enlightenment. We'll get to how that's so once we understand the process, okay? 
<laughs> so the process begins from conviction. I tried this method and it works. There are so many well-known methods like anapanasati, which means watching the breath, or simple meditation. Just sit there and do nothing. Watch what happens. <laughs> it's so easy, huh? that simple, one-step process. Sit there, watch. You'll be surprised. What happens is, Right now, our attention span is tiny. It's a microscopic, you know? So by sitting without expectations, we open up our attention span. And then we begin to see things that we never saw before. I'm not gonna ruin it for you by, by telling you the end. You have to do it for yourself. You have to see for yourself. And once you see, then you realize, oh man, everything he was saying is right. So what happens when we finally get the conviction that this works? Okay, then what? Well, we want to take it further. Huh? And there's actually no end to it. But there are significant mileposts on the way. And that's what this diagram shows. Actually, the process of enlightenment is exactly the same process as the process of becoming. Only it leads out of becoming to cessation and unbinding. So each step in the process of enlightenment corresponds to one of the steps in the process of becoming. For example, ignorance, the first stage of the process of becoming, leading to suffering, corresponds to conviction, the first step in the process of enlightenment. Similarly, fabrication corresponds to contentment. Huh? See, when we fabricate a being based on desire, remember, I like, I don't like, and I don't care, huh? or desire, hatred, and ignorance. If we, if we fashion, if we fabricate a concept of being based on these three, desire, aversion, and ignorance. Well, what do we wind up with? Suffering. But if we fabricate a being based on competence, conviction, then we wind up with contentment. Because instead of ignorance, we have knowledge. Instead of simply liking and disliking things, we weigh things according to their contribution to our enlightenment. We do one thing because it brings us closer to enlightenment. We reject doing the other thing because it takes us farther away. It now is not anymore, I like and I don't like. It's, this is good for enlightenment, this is bad for enlightenment. You see, we start to detach ourselves. We start to become objective. We start to become beings based on reason instead of just sentiment, instead of just sense perception, likes and dislikes. And that changes everything. When the reasons for doing what we do or not doing what we don't do are rational and based on enlightenment, that produces a completely different kind of being. There's no ignorance anymore. Instead, now there's knowledge, certainty, understanding. And that brings us further along the path. And then the next stage is rapture. So instead of consciousness, instead of awareness interacting with sense objects, we have awareness turned in focused on itself, and this brings rapture. Dude, you want rapture, you want pleasure, you want orgasmic ecstasy, huh? That's where it is. It's not in the senses. Yeah, you can get a little tickle through the senses, and it lasts a few seconds and it's over. Then we want it again. 
but we're feeling depleted, so we have to wait. Not so with rapture. With rapture, it's available anytime, in a moment. Just take a breath and turn the awareness in to contemplate itself, to reflect itself. Awareness is like a mirror. It's objective. It reflects whatever you put in front of it. So if you approach the world with your awareness, with a filter, huh? I like, I don't like, I don't know, I don't care, huh? of course it winds up in suffering. That's a really stupid basis for living. But if you approach enlightenment, or if you approach life as a means to enlightenment, and say, I do this because it furthers me on the path. I don't do this because it holds me back on the path. And I have the knowledge that if I simply turn the, the awareness in, reverse the flow, turn the light around, and shine it on itself, then I realize things. I come to know things I never knew before. And I gain new abilities. The ability to have rapture at any moment. I, I mean, I, how can you express the value of it? It's like being able to have an orgasm at any time. Huh? Women are more fortunate than men in this way. Although if you develop a tantric orgasm, you can have whatever you want. That's another series. <laughs> This rapture of awareness, contemplating or reflecting awareness, is very, very tantric. You take this awareness residing in the third eye, and you focus it on itself. And all I can tell you is it's beautiful, it's bliss. But think about the economics of ecstasy. Everyone needs ecstasy. And we find that the people who deny themselves sexual ecstasy, for example, start developing very negative traits. Hatred, prejudice, violence, things like that. They become neurotic. They become frustrated. And they take it out on everybody around them. We don't like to be around people like that. They make us sad. Uh, why do they make us sad? Because they are denying a human need for ecstasy. Ecstasy is there in nature. Every animal experiences it. Uh, but most human beings deny it because of stupid social and religious prohibitions against it. You know, if you go to church and you, you go in ecstasy, you'll get thrown out. Most churches, anyway. I know some holy roller churches that are cool. <laughs> but most churches don't get it at all. You can't be in ecstasy in church. You can't be in ecstasy in a temple, in most temples. So, again, I know a few temples where it's okay. <laughs> But the real ecstasy is found alone, in silence, in deep contemplation and reflection on awareness, in meditation. See, this means the, the attention span grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? There's no need to go anyplace. There's no need to do anything because now you have rapture, ecstasy on demand. You have it on tap. Just flip the switch, you got it, see? Normally, our ecstasy is very expensive. We have to avoid all of the repressive people, all the neurotic people. We have to go off somewhere where we have enough privacy, or maybe we need you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or this or that or drugs or liquor or whatever. Very expensive. And then once we get it, it's just a few seconds and it's over. Very, very expensive. Huh? And because it's expensive, because it's rare, it becomes very valuable. So, for example, prostitution. 
even though for thousands of years, religion has tried to wipe out prostitution and law and governments have tried to wipe it out. It's still there. Why? People need ecstasy and it's rare, so it's expensive. But you can just sit down anywhere for free and contemplate your awareness. <laughs> it becomes abundant. It becomes easy to get. If that means it's cheap. It's not a big deal anymore. Anybody can have it. You don't need to get violent to experience, you know, people go to the bar and drink. I've seen this. I was in Guam for a while. A lot of servicemen in Guam. And of course, they're terribly frustrated. So they go to the bars and drink and start fights. Huh? Happens in Texas too. <laughs> it's a sport. You go to the bar, you get drunk enough, and then somebody starts it, and then the whole place just melts down. <laughs> and it's a kind of ecstasy. Very, very perverted ecstasy. But for a few minutes, for a few seconds, you get to live totally. People go to war because of this. Because in war, for a few minutes, you get to live total. You get to be 100%. So, so many destructive things are going on because people don't know how to find ecstasy. But that's easy. That's one of the first things you get. Third jhana. Uh -huh. The third jhana is feelings of bliss simply due to concentration of the mind upon its own nature. Anybody can do this. Not everybody does because it takes time, it's a skill, you have to practice and perfect it. Now, these ecstasies gradually become deeper and deeper until they become samadhi, okay? I'm not gonna go through all the interrelations of the two processes of becoming because you can figure that out, you're smart, right? So, when you get to the point of samadhi, samadhi is like a new sense beyond the six senses that we talked about earlier. It's like an, an opening into another dimension. It, I can't explain it. It's inexplicable. You have to experience it for yourself. But when you do, let us know <laughs> so we can congratulate you. <laughs> but also, when you do experience it, you'll find your life changes. It has a new center of gravity outside of the world, within you at the deepest level. Now, you have something heavier than the world. You have a fulcrum. You have a center of gravity that's stronger than any pull the world can exert upon you. Samadhi. Buddha's samadhi was so deep. One time he was meditating in a cow shed. And just then there was a huge rainstorm, thunderstorm, and lightning. And quite a few cows and bulls were electrocuted by the lightning, and several men too, cowherd men, trying to herd the cows in. And you can imagine how loud that must have been. So after it was all over, Buddha came out of the shed and said, hey, what's going on? You can imagine there must have been a big crowd and people all excited. And so, what's happening? He said. He said, but didn't you hear all the thunder and lightning? He said, no, I was in meditation. <laughs> Try to explain. What happens in samadhi is that you discover something within yourself that is so interesting, so captivating to the mind, that the mind is naturally attracted, just like iron to a magnet. It, it can't help itself. It just stays stuck to it. <laughs> 
and that's samadhi. So once you gain this samadhi, you get the, the eye of the Dhamma, huh? Dhamma Chakku, means you suddenly see how the path works. You suddenly realize the engine of enlightenment. You suddenly um, come to know the process, not as something outside yourself that somebody taught you, but as a natural progression inside yourself, and you begin to see where it all leads to the secret of the golden flower.